Thanks very much, uh, Ove, for those kind words. Um, I think it's interesting that the two states that dominate the east coast of Australia, Queensland and, um, of course, the west coast, have some foresight in uh, appreciating the value of marine science, and Ove is also the Queensland Premier's fellow, so we have some relationship, in, but on the, I'm on the other side of the coast. Right. Um, I'm going to give a kind of um, a more detailed talk about some of the things we've learned from looking at recent longer term records and also going back a few hundred thousand years in what the climate's been doing and trying to pull some different themes together. I'm also going to highlight some what I think are the key uh, risks that we have to worry about with climate change. And many of them, of course, are very obvious, so I'm not going to be saying a lot that um, you probably haven't heard in some different context before. Oops, have I gone the wrong direction? Uh -huh. Now, the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> th this shows the record of CO2 going back uh, 10,000 years, this curve here. And the most obvious thing, if you just look at this record, is that in the last one to 200 years, we have this tremendous spike from about 260 ppm up to now over 400 ppm. And that increase started about, it started in the early 1800s, but most dramatically from about the 1950s onwards. So, um, I mean, I should say in the geologic record, there is some variability. Back in about 5,000 years, there was a small 20 ppm increase. And I could talk about that in detail, but that's probably actually when coral reefs started to get going and they actually, when they do calcify, release uh, some CO2. But it's a very small effect and there's no question that, of course, that this, this spike is due to our, our use of energy, in particular coal, um, oil, and... Um, and a lesser extent, natural gas. And I think the other interesting thing is the two states that have the most to lose, Queensland and WA, also <laughs> are the major coal is the dominant export from out of Queensland. I know, and I noticed the exports haven't slowed down. Mackay currently, I heard in the news, has 70 coal loading carriers waiting offshore. Um, the demand is, seems to be uh, unending. From the WA viewpoint, the gas is actually becoming very important off the northwest shelf, and also I hear in, from coal seams in Queensland. This is actually, in some ways, better news because it is a more efficient energy, and per um, joule of energy that we burn, it releases less CO2. So it does give us some kind of, um, it's a slightly more beneficial use than coal, but we still actually haven't moved our economies yet. Um, to, to, to a low CO2 emission. And that's really, I think, a fundamental issue that society has to deal with. And, and as Janice showed, the rates of CO2 emission are actually increasing. So this curve... Whoops. I'm sorry, I'm hitting the wrong button all the time. Did I hit the... What I, oh, here we go. Sorry. <coughs> So just get you to advance the... Okay. Well, now I'll continue on with my talk anyway. <laughs> um, what I'm, there are, Janice um, highlighted lots of different phenomena to do with climate change, and I'm just going to pick out three of the key, what I think are the key issues, and, and some that I've been working on personally that I can add some insight to. I'll now hit the... I can see the arrow now. I'm hitting the wrong one. Um, the first issue is sea level rise, uh, and there's actually two, two phenomena happening. One is that the thermal expansion of the oceans due to the warming, and the other, which I'll talk about, is possibly the more serious of the catastrophic uh, ice sheet melting. Now, there's some, where we end up with this, of course, depends on what the temperatures are. So these are different models depending on what we release in CO2, and it looks like, as Janice said, we're actually tracking the, the high end of this. An interesting result that came out recently is showed the sea level rise, um, well, and this shows in a, re a reconstructed curve. The actual, the measured curve that we have is the blue curve here, and there's been a kind of funny a decrease in about 1960. You can see the curve going up and decreased, and what this author did was to look at storage of water on, on, in dams, and if you remove the effect of water storage, 
and reconstruct it what it would have been if you, we weren't building all these dams, you would then have this red curve. So that's going at about two and a half millimetres a year. But if you look at it more carefully, uh, you'll see that that last piece from 1980 on was actually going much faster, about three and a half millimetres a year. So that kind of suggests that it's consistent that the rates of warming are increasing and the rates of sea level rise from thermal expansion, this is from just the temperature increase, there's no evidence yet for major ice sheet melting. <clears throat> and if we take that into account, um, we'll get by 2100, you know, point 0.3 or point 0.4 of a metre sea level rise. And that's an inevitable, this is a, a very clear cut, undisputable, and it, the only question is, is it going to go faster? Is this rate going to actually continue? If it steepens, we'll get uh, greater rises. In Perth, where I've moved to, they have another problem of subsidence, turns out, that parts of the Perth Basin are sinking at about the same rate, about three and a half millimetres a year. Now, for Perth, that actually means then, instead of getting to this point by 2100, the Perth Basin will get to it by 2050. Now, that's not that far away. <laughs> And actually, when you come and visit Queensland, Brisbane, um, of course, the, sense, the, the vulnerability of this region to even a tenth of a metre sea level rise is, is very significant. So sea level rise is a serious uh, problem. But as yet, I haven't dealt with the major issue of, of ice sheet collapse. Um, <clears throat> there's another thing happening is that uh, most of the ice... Um, and potential sea level rise is sitting in the west, in the Antarctic, and most in the West Antarctic area. These black areas are actually parts of the ice that are sitting below sea level. And in, in the West Antarctic, there's an unusual situation where this ice is pinned by a large ice sheet. This has been known for many years, it's not a surprise, and actually this is a cross section, shows the ice, it's grounded, and it's been pinned out in the front um, by this barrier, the Ross Sea. The East Antarctic isn't seen to be so vulnerable. Um, the, the concern now is that um, this pinning may be un in jeopardy because we have major features like water, pour ice sheets melting and, and water now directly pouring into these ice sheets. And this is actually a radar imagery of water now at this contact between the, the bedrock and the ice sheet. And of course then the concern is that this whole ice sheet could destabilise, slide off into the ocean, and will then give us a significant sea level rise. I'll now talk about the, the magnitudes. We're talking about at least four to eight metres. Um, but the timing of this is uncertain, and we can learn a little bit about it from what's happened in the past by looking at um, what, how coral reefs have recorded sea level rise. So when we go back in the geologic record, <coughs> And some places like this at Human Peninsula, these are all coral reefs stacked up, give us a beautiful history of sea level rise. So here we are today, and we have these very large oscill oscillations going back over 120 metres. So when we talk about plus four metres or eight metres in the, in, in the last 100,000 years, that's not very much. We've, uh, we've had over 100 metres um, less than 20,000 years ago. <coughs> The interesting period actually is back in this last time the Earth was warm as it is today, this last in the glacial period. And here you can see that sea levels seem to be a little bit higher than today. So this is an interesting period to look at because in some way it's a natural analogue to what we may be facing today in terms of sea level. And if you go around to some of these reefs, you actually find that when sea level does rise, coral reefs actually do quite well. They quite like it because they can follow the sea level rise up. But that's, there's one condition to that, is that, well, there's actually two, two conditions. First, the CO2 levels were lower than today. There wasn't high CO2. They were around uh, 280 ppm, 300. So this, they don't have, I'll talk about the effect of CO2 shortly. And the second thing is that they had no other disturbance much from uh, runoff or humans. So we weren't, they, they were in a natural, highly pristine environment because there were no humans around. And so it does give us a bit of a lesson, if you like, that sea level may not be a sea level rise may actually be okay for reefs but we've got to minimize there cannot be any human disturbance because you won't get this great growth of corals if there's a lot of disturbance <coughs> along the west australian coast um, we find lots of reefs at about this three to four meter height and this is actually the best data set that tells us how 
um, how much sea level rise we got the last time this, this West Antarctic ice sheet probably melted. And the reason why it's such a great data set is that we have Ningaloo Reef here and strung along this, the western margin, uh, they're all at the same height because it turns out that West Australia is a very stable tectonic continent and actually records exactly what these previous sea level rises were because there's no other things to account. If you have uplift of the actual land, then you lose your reference point. <coughs> so this gives us a very good idea of um, last time we went through a warm period where sea level got to. So we shouldn't be surprised, therefore, if we get back to the same condition. And so one of the questions then is, what were some of those conditions? Now, Janice again has given a nice introduction talking about how the climate boundaries have been moving southwards. Um, the current limit of coral reefs is around here in uh, Hudum and Abrolhos Islands, and we're now seeing the tropical, the subtropical region moving southwards. And sure enough, in the last interglacial, when we go back uh, way down here, we've now found some coral reefs up again at this three to four metre height, telling us that when the conditions were about two to three degrees warmer, we had prolific coral growth, and yes, we had higher sea levels. So the link be then between warming, we can establish a link between the warming, and in this case, it's due to the intensification of the Lewin current, which brings water southwards, linked to sea level rise. The next challenge I'm trying to figure out is to pin that timing down a little bit better because there's obviously a lag between the warming and the sea level rise which we would like to refine so that I can, rather than say can, it's going to happen in the next thousand years, um, the, the ice sheet melting may happen in a hundred years or two hundred years but we still, fu we still fundamentally can't constrain the, when that destabilisation of the ice sheet will occur within a thousand year era but we know it's going to happen. It could happen tomorrow, by the way. I mean, the error is unfortunately large. <laughs> so, but we're trying to pin this error down because if we can understand that in 100 years we're going to have a four metre sea level rise plus the thermal expansion, it gives a whole different perspective as, it is, as opposed to saying we have half a metre sea level rise, although the thermal expansion part is by itself significant. And this just shows all the data that we have that shows it's around this three to four metre high level back at this warm period of the last interglacial. And of course, this is just a summary of that sea level part. I don't have to say that there's many parts that are vulnerable. And I was just looking along the coastline um, of uh, the, on the weekend and, and I've noted, noted a lot of land works because of the cyclone that a lot of the, uh, these um, on the Gold Coast and, and in the Sunshine Coast, uh, a lot of uh, developments are under threat already because especially after a cyclone when this slightly elevated sea level we've got is now causing serious problems. Okay, the next thing I'll move on to is ocean acidification and I'll give a brief overview and again give a little history, a little outline of what, what we've, we've done on this subject. <coughs> um, again, it's, this is actually a chemical effect again from this pulse of CO2 and what happens is this is a the chemistry now of seawater is changing because we've increased CO2, we have atmospheric CO2 and it dissolves in seawater. And I won't go through these different reactions, but as you dissolve seawater, you make, well, I am going through them now, uh, carbonic acid, and it, can, it actually forms different forms of carbonate. Uh, and the, for corals itself, the key form is the carbonate iron. And so it, you react calcium and carbonate and you make the calcium carbonate skeleton. It turns out that there's an, there's an equilibrium between carbonate and the different bicarbonate species and what we're doing is shifting um, down this curve the, so the amount of carbonate is decreasing. So if you do the simple calculation, if we double CO2, the amount of carbonate iron is going to decrease from around 220 to 140 uh, ppm. So that then is this issue that, and I've spent a lot of other people been worrying about this, is that um, it, we're decreasing significantly the amount of carbonate iron available to form um, calcium carbonate. And there's actually, there's a form for this, it's called um, this, this term here, gamma or alpha. Anyway, it's a Greek term. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> um, to be serious though, the, the, the real issue is, is the following, and at the moment we mainly just have experimental data on this, and that is that 
the, 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 the satur this term which is loose, which we generally use as the saturation state is affects the calcification because as I said it's essentially the concentration of the carbonate ion and how does that affect the calcification. Now people were a little surprised that 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 um, there is some evidence that there's a kind of linear effect but when people have done the experiments it's a bit all over the shop. We're still busy and lots of labs are still busy getting lots of data on this. This is one of the most critical issues is how is the decreasing carbonate ion going to affect the actual rate of a calcification. If it's, if it's linear then if we halve the calcification, if we halve the carbonate ion then we'll halve the calcification rate. But there could be some other forms of it. And this again shows the same diagram. Now, we, and, and this is a model that I've actually published showing, predict, just a, a model showing as you increase the CO2, how the, how the carbonate saturation will, will, will decrease. So as you go from 280 up to over 450 to 650, this saturation state will decrease. Um, you'll see back in early times, we're in the blue, blue parts, about three to four, and if you go up to 650, we'll get into the red zones where we're getting close to one. Um, and I'll explain that as you get, if you get less than one, then actually aragonite, this, this aragonite starts to dissolve. And other people have calculated the effect of calcification, assuming a linear relationship between the two. But as I said, there's a lot of uncertainty because the experimental data is, is still uh, difficult. These are difficult experiments to do because when you, you can try and grow corals and change the saturation state, there's other parameters that often change. The corals get stressed anyway. So what we've done is to say, well, let's go out and look at the real world and see if we can figure out what's actually been happening. And, and again, Ames has been involved in this, but we've been looking at it from a more chemical viewpoint. And so we've been, we've, this is what, I'll show you now data from Arlington Reef just off Cairns. And, and uh, this actually shows the flood plumes as well. <coughs> but we've decided to use this reef as an example because it's probably, the, the and Green Island that sits there are probably the most visited reefs of anywhere in any, any place in the world. And there's a little trick it turns out that not only is the, I showed you that relationship between carbonate and bicarbonate, and a boron system has a very similar relationship. I won't go through the details, but we can measure this isotope shift and we can get a pH relationship. So we can actually, and it turns out we can do this in these coral cores. So we can actually measure boron in the coral cores and we have an idea of how the pH is shifting and so we can go back in time and look and see how the pH has changed over time. Because again, as Janet Janice mentioned, that the records that we have of pH are very short. They only go started in the 1980s and we have no long-term records. So we've taken the coral core and we've gone back and measured this boron back to 1800s and we can see this record here. And sure enough, we're seeing a decrease in pH as we might expect. Um, but it is interrupted by some dips like this and a major dip here. And it turned out when we looked at it more carefully, that was actually the 98 bleaching. And this dip, we, I think, may be another bleaching event we hadn't recognised before. Also, when you measure the carbon isotope composition, you see it decreases as well. And this is actually a well-known effect called the Zeus effect because it's coming from carbon from fossil fuel burning that has a different isotopic composition. So therefore, we can link, this trend is clearly due to fossil fuel emissions and the shift in pH is, is consistent with that. So things are starting to happen as we might have expected, um, except actually the shifts are, if you take this shift as real, about 0.3 pH units, it's much larger than we would have expected so far. It's about, we would have expected about a tenth of a unit, it's now about three times greater. Um, <coughs> we've also looked at the calcification only on this coral, we haven't actually seen the shifts that, that Janice referred to, but we don't have enough data here to actually, to get the calcification, you have to have large databases and, and, and that's still, still, we're just independently assessing that. Um, we do nevertheless see when, when there is a bleaching event, you can see that the uh, calcification does generally decrease sharply because the extension rate of the corals stops as, as Janice showed. Now it's not all bad news, this effect. It turns out some marine organisms actually have increased their um, calcification rate or their mass. And it turns out 
this is a species that is very important in the open oceans, the blue, ocean, blue water, and they make up 50% of the calcifiers, these are copaliths. And for some reason, these, it's not well understood, but as CO2s increase, they grow in size. And we think that's because they're probably using the bicarbonate species, which actually increases as you increase CO2. So that kind of makes sense. But it shows that the effects are complicated, that you can't just use corals alone as the an analogy. There will be other species that do OK. So the ecosystem is going to shift quite dramatically. Um, and so this is a whole new realm that we have to try and understand. Um, th this to summarise this effect is that if we burn all our fossil fuel that we, ha that we have on Earth, then we can potentially shift the um, pH of surface waters by 0.7 of a pH unit, almost turn it acid, not quite, and that these effects will last for many thousands of years. So we are on an experiment that is um, uh, quite... Um, it's almost, it's, it, it has occurred natural, well, through geologic record maybe once every 100 million years and usually marked by major extinctions, right? So wh when it occurs, um, it's not a nice place to be around. Um, and, the, and, and actually, the, the other key point to make is that if we increase increasing the CO2, this is the global average, we'll, the, the, all the surface oceans will um, have the saturation state less than one, and when they get less than one, they start to dissolve. So aragonite will start to dissolve, and a little bit later, calcite will start to dissolve. But we do still potentially can avoid this if we taper off our CO2 emissions. So we're at the crux now where we have to decide what we're going to do uh, to this major change in the chemistry of the oceans. Finally, I want to come back to what I think are things that we can deal with directly um, as managers and users and custodians of, of the greatest coral reef systems on, on our planet. And these are the local effects, and there are many of them, and I'm, not, of course, not going to deal with all of them, but I will just discuss this, um, the impacts from river flood plumes. <coughs> and one of the things about um, the, 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 the uh, catchments of the Great, particularly of the Great Barrier Reef, is that the river catchments uh, are dominated by agricultural use, particular cattle farming, <coughs> and that this occurred some time ago. The expansion of the, uh, the cattle industry um, is shown here, it was back in the 1860s, and was pretty much complete throughout Queensland by the 1890s. So if we want to understand the effect of cattle grazing on coral reefs, it's not much point looking today at it, we have to go back and look at what the situation was like prior to this time. Uh, and there were some massive increases in cattle numbers, I should say, very dramatically uh, soon after the 1860s. So to do this, we again use our coral cores and we were able to go back um, and look at the sh this history um, by using these long-lived corals, which again Janice has talked about. But now uh, there's a little chemical trick we've, we've used is that it turns out when you have a major uh, river flooding, <coughs> it brings out sediment, that this sediment absorbs barium from the clays and barium has a characteristic that it looks like calcium to the coral. So the corals can't distinguish between calcium or barium and they take up this barium as thinking it's like calcium. So we have a, uh, and it turns out that barium is, tells us how much sediment's been delivered to the rivers. We've just checked this out by measuring um, a flood plume and, and it acts as you get close to the flood plume, very low salinity waters. Um, you have high barium as you get away from the flood plume you tend to get the seawater value. And this, in fact, this is a near straight line, tells us there's no other complications. It's a conservative tracer is the geochemical term for this. And so since it's also got this ability to substitute in the coral, we've just simply gone along with our laser ablation instruments and been able to measure a long time series. And what we found the very first order was around 1860, when the cattle, when they first started grazing this, the barium peaks uh, grew very rapidly. And if you look at it in more detail, um, we can actually pick the first event when this occurred. So um, in 18, the major flood, these are, each of these are individual flood events. So 1870 flood was the major pulse. There's a small pulse in 1859, but from then on, these every time there's a major cyclone, up goes the barium. And this is the evidence that we now have that 
the sediment input into the Great Barrier Reef from these big rivers has gone up by a factor of five to ten, and it's a very obvious signal. It's the increase of that compared to before cattle settlement. So it's not a fancy statistical argument, it's pretty self-evident. And we can do it event by event, okay? So, so um, when there's no floods, there's no increase. Um, and we've continued to do that, and we can uh, look at this event matching. And, and, uh, and so th from 1900 to the present, and what I've also done is put the cattle numbers in the vertical catchment uh, in, this, in this olive color. And you can see that there's a general, every time there's a major peak in cattle numbers, that the fo following flood has this highest um, the signal. It's interesting that the 74 flood, the biggest on record that Janice mentioned, doesn't have the biggest signal. And the reason is that there's a numbers of uh, floods beforehand so that the catchment was, was, if you like, better prepared. It was a greener catchment. But the biggest event occurred in 80, 1981 coincident with the biggest lot of numbers of cattle because what happened the farmers put by the you know catchments are green we put lots of cattle out and then there was a drought <laughs> and so the this event with the larger sediment um, outflow is actually just a modest flood event we're now busy recollecting new materials to see what happened the last de decade ha how has the question we're now trying to address is how has the recent changes in land management can we start to see a de declining decrease in this barium, which equals sediment discharge into the reef as a result of a lot of effort to reduce um, these lo this local uh, effect? Now, to draw all this together, it's clear that reefs and corals are, are, are complicated, and they're responding to all these different pressures in different ways. And this is an attempt to, to show that. I haven't discussed the coral bleaching, but um, you can imagine that the local runoff certainly can help the algal component. Um, it's possible that it also influences crown of thorns, and sea level rise, as I said, can in fact oops, uh, help. Um, is good. Sea level rise by itself is not devastating for coral reefs, only if, if the reef is itself well managed. So I think um, the lesson that um, I'm trying to get across here is that um, we can do something about it. We maybe argue that Australia, we can't, you know, if the, if the global CO2 is going up, that's going to be perhaps a bit out, you know, we can put our voice on the international stage, but if it is going to happen, it'll, it's going to be other countries probably. But locally, we can do a very lot. And, and I think by reducing the local impacts, we can prepare the reefs for sea level rise, make them more resilient, so that when bleaching occurs and when the acidification occur is, is, is increasing, that at least they have the optimum chance of survival. And I think we do obviously have a societal role to, to deal with this thing of reducing atmospheric CO2. Uh, we have a major responsibility because we're major exporters of coal and, and other energy uh, usages. Uh, thanks very much.